Sandra. Who are okay. we? Okay. Oh, is it my turn? I think so. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. You're you. Yeah, I don't know. It don't matter to me. <laughs> We're the screaming divas. We're the screaming divas, people. Screaming divas. Yeah, I'm not singing it today. And who did we interview today? I mean, this person's a legend. This person, what he has accomplished in his life, not only in his business life, but in his personal life. This is an amazing, lovable, lovable human being. I just loved him. Canadian, Ben Hepner. Oh. <laughs> Jazz hands, high notes. I mean, you just want to hug him. I wanted to hug him through the Zoom. I know. And such a great storyteller. Oh, amazing. He needs, uh, a, pod he needs a podcast stories with Ben. Seriously, people. Yep. I know, I, you know, come on. We're putting it out there in the ethernet. You know, he, he is such a lovable person. So down to earth. Uh, and after he stopped singing opera, had a whole, has a whole nother career in the radio broadcasting business. Um, I mean, what else can we see? I Held just, in tenor. Held in tenor, incredible career. Uh, we asked him some questions that can help out some, you know, generations that are coming up. We talked about the opera business as it is today. This is just a really feel good interview. You will yeah. just be so lighthearted when you're done listening to this. So stay tuned, people. This is yeah. such a, an awesome human. I, I love That's it. That's perfectly, perfectly stated, Carrie. It's a feel good interview. Yeah. It, it's just, you want to hug him at the end of it. Like, Yay! And we tried. We tried. So watch, right. make sure people check this one out, okay? Please. And check out the clip. Yeah, don't miss this one. I promise you'll be you'll be in a good mood when you're done listening to this, people. It's true. Yeah. Be safe, everyone. Bye. Bye. I think one of the things I learned along the way was, and I, I tell this to young students, as I said, don't be so eager to get everybody's opinion. I said, if you hear somebody who sings well, you can talk to them, you know, talk to them, but ask them questions. But, but don't be sort of, um, you know, getting on your knees and and in supplication somehow to this new person who's going to be your, your mentor or something. I said, you need to build yourself a team, um, a team that you trust, your teacher, your coach, your uh, your spouse, significant other, um, and any other people who have earned the right to give you their opinion beautifully said yeah woohoo hi. hi just like Greg. that presto change Greg. yeah how are you ben i'm very well thank you and yourself good this is this is my friend carrie alchema yes, she's the I, other I, half I, of I know Carrie just just from uh, the, the opera broadcasts and things like that. Oh, uh, great. great! Great to meet you, Carrie. It's great to meet you too. You know, I was in I was singing at COC when you were there singing Tristan. And oh, yeah. I, oh, okay. And I was so fortunate enough to sit in the audience. I I didn't want to miss that, and it was glorious. So I, it's so nice to sit here and talk with you today, and maybe fangirl a little bit because it was awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. It was my it was my last Tristan, I think. I think yes, if I remember correctly, yeah, it was. But I really loved it. I don't know how y'all did it because it was you were standing on a little black box like the whole entire show. It seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't that so much, but there was there was this scream going on behind us of this this movie. Yes. and we were wearing black, so everything was kind of predicated on the fact that they didn't want to see the singers. <laughs> what as um, normal people <laughs> wait a second what's the name of the opera <laughs> yeah, that's not how they put it but uh that's the way i uh i kind of took it oh i maybe i should go get my uh my coffee oh wait i have coffee being delivered to me oh that's kind yeah, ex yeah except that my beloved is uh struggling with uh a, a leg problem a knee problem oh no so she so she has to use a crutch oh. <laughs> And carrying coffee is not the easiest thing. I you need to go get it. <laughs> Do you need to pause and go get it? We oh, sure. It. Oh, oh, yay. <laughs> thank you, beloved. Thank Hello, you, guys. Thank you, beloved. That's, that's, well, that, uh, that's my, uh, on, on, on the radio show, she's always my beloved. Oh. How long have you been married? How, or together? 
42 years married. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Wow. Child bride. <laughs> well, that's what I'd like to say. Yes. <laughs> well, I how have you been? Fun. I mean, let's, okay. let's just like go right in like the yeah. pandemic. Uh, it go, uh, doing fine. Uh, I was, uh, I had, I had already sort of given up the, the singing career and in, I think it was 2014. And so, uh, I, I was in radio already and that, that was working out great. And then, um, uh, the, along came the pandemic and there was sort of a two week hiatus where, um, we weren't able to do any recording. We couldn't go into the studio, but then we, in those two weeks, we figured out how to get me to record at home. And um, I've been working remotely ever since, since the middle of, uh, so the end of March. You still huh. haven't been in? No, haven't been into the studio. Um, so is, your, is your wife ready to send you back into the studio or <laughs> has it been okay? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, it's, she's she's had the same problem. She works as a minister, actually, in a church, okay. and uh, I wouldn't you know the the the, the things closed, churches closed, and um, she hasn't been able to go back in either. So she's been doing all of her work on Zoom, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it, it worked out really well, actually. And we, and then we've had an even closer time uh, in the last uh, 18, 19 weeks mm -hmm. with this with this knee problem for the first 10 or 12. Um, she wasn't able to do any walking at all. And she, in fact, she couldn't even get up the stairs because mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I've been nursemaid for for that time. That's a but long time with a physical um, uh, physio uh, therapy. Uh, she's been able to, she's got most of her walking back just as they will have to use a crutch right now. Okay. Uh, all during <laughs> still a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, pandemic. But uh, the first summer was not difficult at all for us. We have a big backyard with a pool and the kind of stuff. And our grandkids were able, we sort of, we decided to uh, isolate, but in three separate houses. Mm -hmm. So we didn't, we didn't expand out of that uh, bubble. Um, unless um, without everybody's permission. So we kept everything very close. So with the summer was fantastic. Only when they went back to school did, did, did we have to start to be more careful. And that's continued on. And then now in the summer, we're able to open up a little bit more again. Uh, so we're, we're, doing, we're doing really well. I'm, um, I'm actually have, I finished my job at the radio as of the end of June, although I'm still on air throughout August and I finish on the Labor Day weekend. Oh, okay. We're doing, really? we're doing, re we're doing repeats and stuff. So I'm uh, officially retired as of the end of Labor Day. Whoa. And yeah, so I'm going to be just a papa. I l are, are you happy about that? I kind of love oh, that, but are you happy about that? Oh, I'm just so thrilled about it. Uh, my beloved, uh, Karen is her name, um, she uh, also left her job the end of June, and uh, so, but she's fighting, fighting the moniker retired. She didn't want anything to do with that. Okay. <laughs> she just wants so to just, call it playtime. It's playtime. <laughs> yeah, new phase. So the summer is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a high, uh, you know, uh, hiatus, uh, what do you call it, a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we, we act actually going, we're going to Munich in the early part of September. I'm going to be a judge in the ARD uh, competition. And um, she's tanking along. We're just going to have some fun in Munich. Amazing. And uh, we'll be back by uh, mid-September. I love that. And you have five grandchildren, is that correct? That's right. That's yeah. right. Awesome. Wow. So now you get to do all the things that you always wanted to do that we always wanted to do while we're singing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could clean the garage. <laughs> <laughs> I call it being a normal person. Yes, what? that's right. Yeah. Finally. It's kind of fun, isn't it? That's for sure. Oh, I, 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 I've, I mean, the radio job has been sort of half time, so it hasn't been all that uh, uh, all consuming. So I've, I've sort of felt like I've had partially I've, I've already been retired mm -hmm. wow well i want to I, I know that okay so now the cat's out of the bag that you're retiring from that but yeah we had a lot of questions to ask about the cbc your two shows and yeah and for instance like how did how did that happen after you retired 
How did you go down that route instead of, say, a general manager of an opera house? Uh, first of all, there's no way that anybody would want to hire me as a general manager because I would say that I'm the wrong person um, for general manager. But radio was always an interest. In fact, at the same time as this radio job came up, another a job teaching came up. And um, it was very clear. Uh, I'd, I'd done a sabbatical replacements for someone who was uh, a sabbatical at, at McGill University. And I did a year of that. And it was, I just didn't feel like I related all that well to teaching. So when this radio thing came up, it was just like, yes, uh, because I've loved radio and um, I've enjoyed every moment whenever I did an interview or and I did a couple of hosting things in, uh, in, in the CBC. I hosted the 2003, I think it was the, uh, the bicentennial of uh, Berlioz's uh, birth. Um, so, you know, I had, I had some little experience and uh, they took a bit of a chance of trying to figure out whether I actually had the ability to, to sound natural on the on air. No, you have such a distinctive voice too. I mean, you, you listen to your speaking voice and you know, that's Ben Hepner. It's it's and it's a very soothing, dulcet, unlike your singing. Well, I mean your singing voice is very <laughs> soothing too, but I mean it's like bam, you know. Yeah. Your, your singing, singing voice, voice is, is not dulcet at all. No, I didn't <laughs> mean that in a negative really wrong. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That it's been matter. a day here. I'm sorry. I get it. I get it. Did you, yeah. know, did you have to like warm up your voice or anything, anything like that for the radio or? I, I, I prefer to, I prefer to record early because my voice is, has much more of a sort of a, a Gary Owens kind of a sound. It has more depth <laughs> into it. So I prefer to record like 9 a.m. rather than, you know, three o'clock okay. in the afternoon where I'm beginning to sound like a, 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 a gray, chalky Mickey Mouse. That's hilarious. <laughs> <Come on. Okay>. Never. <laughs> So of all the people you interviewed with the CBC, was there one interview or two interviews that really stood out in your mind as amazing? Um, well, this is hard. This is all my children, right? Um, <laughs> there, there were so many, so many good ones. Um, there was a Sandra Radvanovsky, of course. Thank um, you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I was trying I, I um, Oh, oh, I kind of, uh, Francesca Zambello did a great interview. Um, when I ask people to do the synopsis, and sometimes it's really difficult, and what I end up doing is just, uh, I, I'll just do it myself mm. in the, you know, fix it in post, as they call it. Mm. And, um, but she was so amazing at just, just doing the, the, you know, the act of, uh, so the synopsis of act one, just perfect. Second, the second act, uh, of I've forgotten the opera that she did it was a Handel piece. Um, it, it was she, she did it in like three sentences, and it was so tiny and perfect that uh, it caught me off guard. Yeah. Um, oh, so she was she was one of the I did Peter Sellers. He was interesting because he he goes um, he kind of goes off into the ether a little bit and uh, yes. And then, and we'll and we'll talk, and he will repeat some of the lines he wrote them. He he has them memorized, and and he will sort of do a whole reading of the text. It was it was hilarious and wonderful all at the wow. same time. Yes, very esoteric, isn't he? And yeah, and yeah. thinks thinks completely different than singers in a way. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a I have a great story of uh, uh, I worked with Peter a few times. The first time was Tannhäuser in Chicago back in '92, I think it was. Anyway, um, th there was a moment here at the at the uh, COC when he was doing the uh, the Tristan, and um, he was working out. Uh, we were doing a staging rehearsal. I'd been asked by the publicity department to do a could I do a television taping? And I said, well, what is a or a video thing for news? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, "What does Peter think?" He said, "Oh, he's he, it's fine. He's fine if you're fine." And then we got, I got to the the studio, and there they are. And um, and I went up to Peter and I said, "You were okay with this?" And he said, "I I, I was told you were okay with it." So I said, "You know, anyway." So he said, "Don't worry, I've got this." So when the rehearsal started and the camera started rolling, he started swearing up a blue streak it was just like unbelievable i mean okay his language is never pristine but that's fine but it was just like horrendous 
And, you know, after about 20 minutes, the camera sort of packed up and left. And he said, let's see them use that on broadcast television. <laughs> Oopsie, not PG rated. You know, that's brilliant. That is really brilliant when they do, you know, tricky things like that to us. It, that's hysterical. What a great, uh, everybody take note. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Don't play one off the other, right? <laughs> or I, I had one, I think it was also Peter who... Uh, um, I did something on it, maybe in this Tannhäuser, and, and it, whatever he asked me to do, I just, I was not committed. I didn't like it at all. And uh, so I, you know, you, what the, one of the ways of coping with a, a, what you think is a silly bit of staging is to overdo it and, you know, just kind of like do it to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And then there was kind of a pause at the other, at the, you know, from out of the darkness. And I heard Peter say, yeah, you're right, Ben, let's do something else. <laughs> we've never done that before ben Ever. no no <laughs> you're giving away secrets here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> isn't isn't that what this is all about yes it is true it's it, it's gossipy i guess we're like opera gossip people in a way i don't we're, know we're like we, the operas of opera i'm just gonna say that it, that's it okay <laughs> well, um, okay go ahead Let's talk about 2014. I know you probably have talked about this ad nauseum, but what leads a person? Because listen, I'm 52 and I'm, you know, thinking about end game. We've talked about this and right. what leads a person and what led you to give up such an amazing career? Was there one thing or was it a compilation? Oh, it was definitely a compilation. Uh, so in uh, 2014, I was 58. And um, I'd actually, I'd actually kind of wanted to leave earlier, but uh, but my beloved, her Karen, um, she said she said I don't, I don't think it's time yet, and um, I was experiencing some vocal deterioration that was very clear, and uh, I, I think it was fixable, but y you know you have to keep at it, you have to really keep at it, and. Uh, um, I, I, uh, I started working with a teacher in Houston, so that's a bit of a, that's a commitment coming from Toronto. Yeah. And, um, and I was also becoming more and more, I, I don't know, homesick, I guess is one of the words I could use. Yeah. Uh, even though my kids were now, uh, they were married, some had, they were having children now. Um, my wife had a really fabulous job that she just adored. So everybody was feeling confident, but except I was kind of feeling like I was drifting in the wind out on the road. Mm -hmm. And I'd kind of ignored it for a long time because I was providing for the family and all those kinds of things. But that uh, insecurity about being away as well as, uh, and I, I wonder sometimes whether that played into the fact that I wasn't singing the way mm -hmm. I wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, there were just lots of things and, uh, uh, and the, because I'd already started the radio job, the transition was awfully smooth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what? you know, I see it's, it's, it's a short journey from here to here, you know, <laughs> when, when we have, when we have issues here that we can't quite, you know, figure out oftentimes they show up here. Or vice versa, you know, and I and I think that people don't always realize in this business that our emotional state s is so reflected in our vocal state. Very know? much so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, try to try to sing it at uh, your parents' funeral, for example. <laughs> you know, you have to absolutely. I, I've done it. You have to arm's length your emo emotions and then just deal with them later. Yeah, yeah, true. You're Superman, by the way. Yeah, oh. right. Oh my goodness. I couldn't but, do it. Was there, um, because of what we all singers have lived through in this last year and a half, especially with so many singers, artists, musicians, conductors being out of work, um, I think that there's quite a few that we're going to lose. And that's an emotional journey, I would think, for anyone that's thinking about leaving the business. Is there any similarities between the emotions that you experienced walking that path of saying, I'm going to close the door on this chapter of my life? Um, in, in terms of the way that I felt about uh, shifting out of this career? Yes. It, it, 
no, I, I didn't find uh, a transition difficult at all. I, I think because my life wasn't the career. Right. They were not. They were not synonymous. Mm -hmm. Either the career was part of my life, mm -hmm. but my life in was was revolving around my wife and and three children and now five grandchildren, mm -hmm. and um, it 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 was. I don't know. There was hardly a. I didn't look back with any kind of regret. There are there are certain things I miss. I miss the the first five days of traveling. Uh, you know, because I a new place and, you know, a new apartment right. and a new city or something. And it's just right. or yeah. revisiting an old city and the old haunts that you love. Mm -hmm. um, but then after a while, I get really tired of it and I would just want to go home and, and be a homebody. I, I, I turned out to be more of a homebody than even I realized. Wow. OK, love that. <clears throat> well, that's, I find that the hardest part of this job. And, and somebody asked me once, when are you going to retire? And I said, the day that I can't leave my house. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, there comes a point where you just say, I can't anymore. And, and I get that, you know, it's, there's so many other things, the singing part of it. And I, Carrie and I, we've talked about this. It, it that's the easiest part of it. Singing. It's, yeah. it's all the other aspects. And now, especially during the pandemic, getting from A to B, Forget it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even getting across the ocean to Munich for us, uh, we have our we've booked our tickets, but there are are there are going to be some challenges, I think, with uh, testing, and we both got of our we got our vaccinations, but still, it's it's not just it's not just straightforward. No. Oh no, it's it, it's it's no easy thing anymore, Ben. And let me tell you, like the amount <laughs> of planning that I've been on. I've had 74 PCR tests since January 1st. Ow. I have no nasal passages left. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's, a, there's a thing that I, there's a thing that I've learned is because we all we've all had to we've all been to the ENT guy, right? Uh, and um, so when you want it, they, they feed something down the nose or whatever to look at your cords. And you can we can all flare or we can all flare our passages. Mm -hmm. And it works rather well for getting a test. You probably have done that many times now that you have to have your 75th or whatever. Oh, uh, that's coming up in two days. Yeah. yeah you, you just kind of flare your nostrils and it makes it easier. So they don't feel like you're scratching their brain. They're scratching oh. your brain all the time. Well, they made Jonas Kaufmann's sinuses bleed in Paris when we were there. They, they were digging for gold. Like they... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. Oh, no, sorry. That's what they call a spit take. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you stopped singing and you didn't look back. No, and no. That's that. You know what? Good for you. And it was obviously the right decision at the right time. And I mean, I t I've told the story before, but but the radio thing, it started early in my life. Uh, I lived in northern British Columbia uh, on I uh, started on a farm you know, outside a place called Dawson Creek, not Dawson's Creek, but Dawson <laughs> Creek. And um, I found this this sort of cabinet radio. It had two old tubes and stuff like that. Um, and I found it worked. And in the wintertime in that area, you get these radio waves that bounce off the stratosphere or whatever it's called. Um, and you, I could pick up stations from Texas, from Chicago, from uh, Los Angeles, um, and uh, so it was kind of my window into the bigger world. So this radio became became uh, a kind of a way to explore beyond uh, what was, you know, the, the farmyard and the animals that we uh, that we looked after and, and the grain that we grew. Um, so so I love radio, and it's it stayed with me the entire time. Uh, so when the job, I realized the job was open and. It just, uh, I flowed into it really easily and I adored every moment. Cool. So full circle, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Would anything bring you out of retirement? Well, I, I would, uh, to sing, you know, I haven't sung in a long time. And um, I, I, so I don't think I'd want to do any sort of opera role thing. Uh, I might do a little appearances if uh, I'm, in fact, I'm considering one, they want to do a, they want to do a video kind of a thing. And uh, I'm not sure because the voice is not responding the way it used to. Uh, 
so I, at least it would be pretty. I'd rather, I particularly would do like narrations or, uh, for example, like the, there's a, 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 what is the one in Gurli there? There's, because they call it Sprecher, maybe. Um, mm. it's, 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 it's on pitch, but it's spoken. And, oh, okay. uh, so I, I, we do something like that, but, um, I don't consider that out of retirement. Uh, that's just kind of fun, something fun to do. Sure. Okay. Well, Hey, uh, once, once a person, I, I think once a person's been on stage, you always have that bug, you know, and that, that feeling of excitement walking on stage, it's irreplaceable really. Yeah, I suppose I'll have, I may have to find it somewhere else. Um, the radio is, is another form of that. It's just, it's just more contained. You have to, you have to talk to one person, not, not to a whole audience. Right. So you don't think about projection, like really sending the voice out. You, you have to, you just have to work in the theater of the mind, this one, one person you're talking to. And it, it takes a little time to figure it out. Yeah. When you look back on your career, all the hills and valleys and ups and downs of it all, is there anything that, is there any advice that you would give to singers going through it, either starting or in the middle of it? That well, you, lessons I, you learned that you would pass on? Well, I, I watched a couple of your earlier uh, uh, podcasts uh, and, uh, or video casts. And um, I, I was one thinking that question would come up. One of the things I didn't go through kind of this, uh, um, starting in the, on the, on the regional houses and, you know, getting decent roles and then working mm -hmm. my way up and then working, transitioning to the bigger houses and working my way up. Um, I, I did the Met competition in 88, I was mm -hmm. 32 and, um, I went from like working Compromario things in Toronto or, you know, Vancouver maybe mm -hmm. to all of a sudden, boom, um, I made my debut as Itamaneo at the Met, Whoa. Was filling, filling in for Luciano. Um, <laughs> but so I didn't, I didn't have that sort of that, that Eddie or that, you know, the, the inclined screw that, that takes me right. higher and higher. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think one of the things I learned along the way was, and I, I tell this to young students, as I said, don't be so eager to get everybody's opinion. I said, if you hear somebody who sings well, you can talk to them, you know, talk to them, but ask them questions. But, but don't be sort of, um, you know, getting on your knees and, and in supplication somehow to this new person who's going to be your, your mentor or something. I said, you need to build yourself a team, um, a team that you trust, your teacher, your coach, your, uh, your spouse, significant other, um, and any other people who have earned the right to give you their opinion beautifully said yeah that is it is and don't take it from everybody um who feels it's their right to tell you their stuff you believe in yourself and um uh take the opinion though of those that you trust uh, mm -hmm. and listen to them work hard to uh, to follow their advice, but don't get so eager to to get some new guru that that follows because people would ask me, I'm sure they ask you, um, uh, you know, you know, what, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And uh, it's just it's just not right. You, you need to be sure of yourself. There's a you know, a, a, what's the you know, seeing as my wife is a minister, I can use a little a little scriptural thing here. Be a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you need to know what you want. Oh, one of the ones that I just, um, uh, you, I heard a bit of a uh, interview with Matthew Polanzani. He has this in spades. Yes. He was, he was so engaging and um, he just has, he knows himself. Mm -hmm. He knows who to believe, uh, who he trusts and who mm -hmm. has earned their right to speak to his life. And his and, priorities are very, he's very sure of that. And he spoke to this whole idea that mm -hmm. I, you know, he, his life isn't all about opera. That's part right. of his life, but it's not everything. Right. And uh, so I think that's one of the bit of advice that I would give. I love that. I, and that's uh, the double-minded man. That That's a pretty profound statement there. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't so, be pulled about by everybody. Mm -mm. 
So I know that you were born into a Mennonite family. Yes, we didn't actually attend a Mennonite church, but we attend a church, just not a Mennonite one. And uh, yes, but it's my background. In fact, the name Hepner is fairly well known in the uh, in the Mennonite world. There oh, were okay. two. There were two people who took the Mennonites um, in, in from northern uh, Germany into the Ukraine or what Russia then was, what is now Ukraine. Uh, in the late 18th century, about 17, mid 1780s, I guess. One was uh, Jakob Hypna, which is ju just a variation of my name. He was a great, he's a great, great something rather to me. Hmm. And uh, I was uh, more related to his brother. And, um, uh, and then the guy by the, by the name of Barch. So the name Hepner is fairly well known because they, they were the two people who sort of negotiated the the land contracts and stuff with the, uh, the government of Catherine the Great. Interesting. So you've done all the genealogy and everything with, with your name? Uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah. Not uh, just enough to know that I was, I'm related to Anton Herpner, not uh, Jakob. Uh, all I am related to, but it's just a more complicated journey. Are you are you still very religious? I know you say your wife is, is a minister. Is it with the Mennonites or...? No, uh, uh, Karen is a uh, uh, is a, well, well had, was up till the end of June, was a minister in a it's a non denominational church called the Bridge in Markham, Ontario. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, so sh so that's what uh, uh, we we've sort of journeyed together over the last forty two years, and uh, we've worked as musicians because Karen is also a trained pianist, and uh, although that's not what her job was. And um, uh, sh sh her job was uh, putting together small groups um, so that people would experience life more connected in a way that rather than, you know, 800 people in, a, in the congregation, it comes down to eight or 10. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, she put them together, usually by age or stage in life, you know, parents raising young children or uh, I we're in a group that's uh, more our own age and that kind of stuff. Ah, nice. So do you have the Von Trapp family at home? Are they all? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Three kids. Uh, our daughter does have a piano degree, and but she does not earn her uh, any living uh, as, a, as, a, as a pianist. She um, did start out doing a lot of accompanying because that's a natural bent for her. Um, but she realized that she didn't like the, um, you know, uh, uh, sporadic kind of life that it is. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, she ended up, uh, well, she ended up getting married and they moved to Salt Lake City. Oh. And um, uh, they, uh, so she hasn't worked as a musician, but uh, has, uh, and, uh, until she finally got her uh, papers to be able to work, um, she had to volunteer. So she played for a, a, a cellist, a teacher, a teacher of cello. And um, in exchange for t for playing for his students, she took p she took cello lessons. Oh, cool! And uh, just a number of things like that. Uh, oh, so that's uh, she's a musician, uh, you know, by training. And then I have two boys, and I think both of them would say. In fact, all our children would say that they are musicians at heart, although they don't earn their um, earn their living. So my my older son, uh, my both my sons are guitar players, bass. Um, uh, my older son is a fair to middle and banjo player and uh, earned, earned his living, uh, in the summers, uh, on the street busking. And, um, cool. yeah, that's awesome. Oh, it's fabulous. I did. I did it when I, I came across him one day and he was working outside St. Lawrence market and he said, uh, you know, okay, dad, dad, come do something with me. So, um, so we did, you know. Soon one morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Something like that, you know? Yeah, that's great. And uh, so, yeah, so my kids are very musical, but they don't earn their living as musicians. Yeah. Okay, so what do your grandkids think about you being an opera singer? I mean, like when you bust out a big note or something like that, just for fun, what do they do? <clears throat> um, plug their ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Well, it doesn't help that I kind of, you know, I kind of grind in on the worst part of what they're doing. I'm trying to come up with what I would, I had, so I had a granddaughter in the vehicle the other day, Monday, and taking her back and we're listening to 
Well, I guess it was frozen. I don't know, frozen two or oh, refrozen no. or whatever it's called. <laughs> and um, refrozen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we'll I, 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 wish, I uh-huh. wish I wish I could bring up the piece because I, I do it when they go to the very top end yeah. of the range and I go with them uh-huh. and I just and I just screech the living daylights out of it. And he's, Papa! <laughs> so you do sing in the car? Oh well, yes, but um, usually I, I get told to just quiet down and listen to the music that I put on. That's hysterical. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Now, you have, correct me if I'm wrong, your own a school of music named after you? Well, yeah, it's not my school of music, but uh, it is named after me. Um, it's the Heather Heights Elementary School in sort of eastern Scarborough. Scarborough. And so they there was some money available through the school board to create a specialty program. And the very wise principal of this, he decided that he they would put together a, a music program. And in order to try to get some notoriety, and they asked if they could use my name. So there's the uh, yeah, Ben Hepner School of, oh, I'm, I'm the, the exact name I'm going to mess up. But yeah, it is Heather Heights, and then it has the Ben Hepner sort of sub-specialty within that school. Um, and I go generally once a year um, in their in their uh, open house times, and I'll maybe perform for the um, uh, for the new prospective uh, uh, students and their parents, mm-hmm. and maybe do an interview, work as a bit of a um, uh, master class with some of the younger singers and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, it's a really cool thing. Although it's it's you know not a lot of kudos go to me. Gotcha. <laughs> Well, I mean, listen, this is, we, we preach this on the show that, uh, without people like you or, you know, forming this music school, music is not going to continue. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. End and, of story. Uh, yeah. That it's really too bad to see these music programs being seen as somehow dispensable and cut out of, because of some budget, uh, consideration. Uh, and it just weakens the, the future of, you know, not just opera, but, you know, you think of all the yep. instrumental, you know, I'm just thinking classical, but also right. even pop music. Right. Uh, people don't get a solid kind of a technical musical training to uh, to make their, uh, not that everybody needs, not everybody needs to know the, the ins and outs of, of musical theory to the nth degree, but they need some to kind of hang their hat. Sure. Well, think of some of the great some of the great pop singers. I mean, I'm I'm going to show my age here, but you know, like Pat Benatar, Barbara Streisand, uh, Barry Manilow. I mean, they were all trained classically. Yeah, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga, and look, yeah. I mean, they're still singing. If they wanted to still sing, they could still sing because that's right. Yeah, they had this technique. Exactly, and I, it's something that uh, sustains you and. Uh, and even if you don't make a career out of it, it is never wasted. Mm-mm, yeah, absolutely not. Where do you, I mean, do you have an opinion on where you think opera will be in the next 10, 15, 20 years from now? Oh, it's, it's hard. It's hard to judge. I mean, I'm kind of out of it, you know, since 2014. Uh, mm-hmm. I go to the, the theater and stuff. But um, I've always had the feeling that in addition to doing the great works uh, uh, from the past, as you uh, as as we all do here, um, uh, rather than just doing you know Tristan's and and uh, you know Bellini's and uh, butterflies and all that kind of stuff, I'm thinking we need new repertoire. We need new stuff. So like musical theater, mm-hmm. they have you know they can do the uh, Music Man or a Carousel or. Uh, um, you know, Titanic. Ti- Titanic. Yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I did Titanic. In case mm-hmm. me. We did our and, research. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> and um, they they do new stuff. Well, with you know Titanic, yeah. it was closer to uh, was a newer piece. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, I was uh, ragtime. I was at the d- debut of that. That's a pretty interesting piece. Um, th- there's just all sorts of wonderful new things coming up. Uh, and and we need new stuff. So I, I would love to see, you know, I did Moby Dick, Jake Hagee piece. Right, right. Um, Great piece. And uh, th- there was, uh, you know, there's other things that have happened, but they're so infrequent. 
that uh, that we need more and we need composers who will write in a way that uh, engages the audience's ear. Some, I think the ears yeah. are hungry for melody. It doesn't have to be the old style of melody. No. But I think it should have a melody of some sort that that pulls us in, not just kind of pointillistic, how high can you sing, how low can you go? Right. Um, you know, not just that, um, but to engage us with great stories. Um, what's, you know, the death of Klinghoffer, Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, what was the one? The uh, the Oppenheimer. Um, uh, uh, Nixon in China. No, Nixon, China. No, well, Nixon in China, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's about Robert Oppenheimer and uh, yeah. of course the name is Gerald Finley. I think um, yeah premiered the role. Um, those those are interesting, and I think they need they need we need more of them because we need more interesting stories rather than take an old story and and kind of just retrofit it in <laughs> some really ugly way to somehow speak to a modern audience mm -hmm. i just don't think it works um yeah. i think you'd be better to stick with the old school and make it and i think people will make the transition themselves but do new stories that do speak to a modern audience so I'm a big fan of modern opera, of, of getting more out there, but also a, a type of composition that also is engaging for an audience. Absolutely. Not just, not just in the mind of the composer. Right. No, I agree with that. We just uh, interviewed Maestro Luisotti, and he said the same thing. He said, I, want, exactly. I don't care that if it's in the same framework as Puccini or Verdi or something like that. I mean, all of those composers took the framework from the composers before them. So why aren't we working that in so that we have these great new opera works that will last the test of time as these have done? And so, exactly. and, I, and I, I really appreciated him saying that because I totally agree. I think that is part of our future. We have amazing stories to be told um, that haven't been told yet in this kind of genre. So why not? Let's go there. Let's jump in. But as you said, let's have the music that that makes your heart jump out of its chest. Yes, and and, yeah. and relates to the people. Absolutely, uh, and relates to the story is more more right. what I meant. Um, I, th I think I think it's uh, not explored nearly as much as it ought to have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't we don't hear when you go to Broadway. You don't hear atonal music. You come out <laughs> of Broadway humming the tunes. Mm -hmm. You know, and Broadway shows are kind of like, you know, the modern day opera in a way. Yes. We don't we don't get these things that are unsingable in Broadway. So right. come on, let people let's just bring it back to opera. And I mean, we have a perfect topic right now. Hello, everybody lived through it. And yeah. it's called a yeah. pandemic, you know, so yeah. I don't know. Among many other things that have happened in the last year and a half, you know, numerous social topics, issues and things like that. Yes. Um, I don't know, you know, you said that, you know, you've been out of it for a while, but um, we talked about this a little bit with Matthew Epstein um, <laughs> in a way of where are the big voices? A lot of, mm. of us feel like we are living in the wild, wild west of opera where everybody is singing really whatever they want. There's no more, hey, maybe I think Tosca is a little too heavy for you. I mean, we've got light lyric soprano singing Tosca right now. And maybe Dramatic voices. And they're going to end up singing Zieglinda, who knows. But um, and a lot of my colleagues are getting asked to sing things where they're going, what are you, are you crazy? How did you even hear me singing that kind of repertoire? So I have that question. Then I also have, where are the big voices? I mean, I, I know, that, and even when I was a young artist, big voices were in America were like, whoa, we don't know really what to do with them. And so, I mean, where are they? Do you have an opinion on anything that I just said? Because that was like, Harry. <laughs> well, yeah, where are they? Uh, well, they're out there as well. I, I just don't know that we found them yet. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a or an article, um, a, a television sort of a documentary about how, oh, a tenor, where have all the tenors gone? Mm -hmm. And there was this whole, the, 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 they posited the theory that the tenors um, were just kind of being, uh, they, we were losing them to uh, sort of genetics, that women liked voices uh, who were deeper and more resonant. So, oh. that, so that they were mating with baritones and bass baritones. Oh, that's and, interesting. Or, I mean, something like that. Yeah. And I say, have you listened to modern music? Have you listened to punk? Have you listened to rock? 
Thank you. They're all tenors. Yep, they are. All, yeah. I said, wait, there was, there was a bass baritone who, who was sort of saying to me, you know, the girl may go, the girl, the, the tenor may get the girl on stage, but they go home with the bass baritone. And, and, and really? I said, well, and I said, it was, it was my best comeback I think I've ever had was, hmm, it's interesting. I'll tell my banker. Oh my God. I love that. I love it you. Was, it, was, it was like I just cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> Best response ever. <laughs> I've never had a better one. <laughs> it's true though, but you know, it, it, is, it, is it because there's a lack of education or lack of time? As I always say, big voices take longer to bake and well, we don't have that luxury of time. Well, part of the other thing is... Uh, there was a couple of there's a couple of little bright spots. Uh, I did. I was a judge in a in a Wagner competition out of Seattle a few mm -hmm. years ago, that was uh, you know dedicated to bigger voices. They raised the age limit, so that Thank some you. of the development had to happen earlier. Uh, Dolores Zajic, of course, has her um, program working with larger voices. Right. Um, and there's a I think Jane Eaglin in um, in Boston is also doing. Uh, a lot of work with, uh, and they have a sort of a Wagner uh, program happening at the end of this month. I'm, I'm going to be doing a master class. Cool. Um, so there's 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 some people who are trying to do it, but I think there's a tendency for the the uh, uh, I don't know who it is opera ha opera houses directors, uh, you know opera intendants um, agents to get their to get their people out and kind of working at a younger age. And so there's not a time for the voice to develop. No. I mean, even when I came in, I, you know, I don't know that I was ever really a Heldon tenor. Uh, it's, I call that, you have to, to be a Heldon tenor, you have to have turbo boost. <laughs> and and I, I, I didn't really have, I didn't really have that all the time. I mean, you know, not like a John Vickers or, you know, Lawrence Melchior or those. Yeah fabulous fabulous voices mm -hmm. um i had something else it was a little more lyric but i could engage my turbo boost when needed okay. and so that That's kind awesome. of helped me help me survive <laughs> kind of like formula one racers now you know the drivers they only have that turbo that they can use every so often and you have to use it wisely so yeah uh, yes probably it uh, there it probably burns up your resources i would think well how do you I, how did you because I can't fathom this. I was in Götterdämmerung at the Met as uh, Gutruna. Yeah. And I remember it was so long that between my next to last entrance and my last entrance, I could get out of costume, go across the street, eat dinner, come back and go back on stage. <laughs> and all the while, you know, you're still there on stage singing away, not you at, in this production, but the tenor. Yeah. How does one train to get through six hours of an opera? Well, I was asked once how, you know, how it was, uh, no, they heard me, they heard me say this, uh, that I had only had a five minute attention span. And they said, well, how is it possible to do Tristan, for example? I mean, it, it's so long. How can you, if you only have a five minute attention span? And I said, well, first of all, maybe I'm making a bit of a joke. Secondly, you do the first five minutes and then you do the next five minutes and then that that's how you do it um tristan was always um was always a little tough because there's a big break between the end of act one and act one's not that much mm -hmm. act two there's a big break before you come on and uh, and then if they at the end of act two because you've sung a lot by this point if there's uh, a longer break as they sometimes do they sometimes do 45 minutes mm -hmm. that was just killing me because your voice goes to sleep yes and um but fortunately wagner had somehow figured it out uh, and uh i don't know whether he did this on purpose yes uh tristan is in a coma he's coming out of this uh you know being in a coma for this length of time and so he doesn't immediately starts out with the high notes he starts out um uh, you know, slowly, and it, mm -hmm. that's how your voice feels. So you kind of just use it to build it in. By the time you get to the flat out massive outburst, you've had a while to get into it. And then you crash. And um, 
then there's more of a uh, uh, rebuild again and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how you survive them, I don't know. It's just it's just part of it's just part of the biz. Somehow you you figure it out. Sometimes you have to rewarm up. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I, there are certain operas that I have to do that too, or constantly keep singing through, like Norma, with with half an hour breaks because you have to figure out. And I tell this to kids in in master class, you have to figure out what your voice does as the night goes on. Some people their voices go higher, some people their voices go lower. Yeah. And if you're doing a role like Norma and your voice goes lower, you're really in trouble. <laughs> or some points, some points their voices just go. <laughs> But True that's that. that's that was part of my uh, I, 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 this is something I loved was figuring out how on earth do you get through Meister Singer, where you've got to be at your best at twelve o'clock at night after having sung for a long time. Now it's not the longest role in the mm -hmm. in the piece, but um, it's still kind of it's it's and you're working up in your passaggio all the time. Uh, where a Zox, for example, doesn't, he can use more of the, the chest voice and it's easier production, I think. Um, so how to figure out to do the prize song at the end and, and still like, still sound like you deserve to win the prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, you speak German? Do you, is, is, is that one of your languages? Uh, sort of, yes, but not, I'm not particularly, I'm not, you know, fleecent as they say. Yeah. Um, but I have a, a good working knowledge and I can carry on basic conversation, although don't do philosophy or anything really calm. I mean, I can do rehearsals and that kind of stuff with German okay. no problem. Um, and, um, it, it kind of worked. My parents spoke German, <laughs> but they just never, they just never taught it to me. That's all. Uh, because my father, uh, my father came from Russia, and he, my father was born 1902, by the way. 1902. Uh, yeah, he was 54 when I showed up, and um, so he spoke he spoke uh, German and Russian when he came to Canada, and then um, never went to school, but he learned English more or less and he could read although he had the craziest accent and um uh, and then my mother also was oh, she was born in canada but she her parents also spoke it's a plattdeutsch a plot is the way they say is the in the in the dialect low german and wow. uh, so they they spoke it at home and they could speak uh they could speak high german because you have to sp god speaks high german apparently right. I'm, I'm <laughs> who knew yeah, collo colloquially they would speak uh, low German. Okay, so you you had it in your ear. For sure. Yeah, I, I can do you know some good good German imitation for sure. In fact, here's here's something I tell um, I, I tell students is you know, singing in Russian. I don't have any Russian training really. I've just done it from doing it and having coaching in it and stuff. But I found a little trick, and it's the stupidest thing, and probably it, it, nobody should really take this seriously, but once you get the words and the syllables all worked out, now add a Russian accent to it. I do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And Learning Pink Dom is the same thing. It's like, sing it like a Russian, you know? Exactly. And you, you know, the, and the L's start to come out right. And uh, mm -hmm. um, I kind of, it's crazy, but you add, a, add a Russian accent, add a, you know, a, a Czech I remember doing a Yenufa, the, the, the Latsa for the first time. And um, so I got a tape of my of my words from somebody. Hello, my name is whatever the name was. And I am your Czech couch. So I just Ouch. took that as couch. I took that as my as my uh, sort of example. And I just went forward with it and it kept adding that accent in and I did OK. Uh, with Czech. Uh, Harry needed that tape, I think, when we did Rusalka. <laughs> that was a hot mess, people. I mean, I I was so, oh, uh, I was like, oh, can we, can I sing this on vowels? Will anybody <laughs> put maybe a hook in there every once in a while? Will anybody know it's here in Canada? <laughs> I remember I worked with, I learned Rusalka with Yvette Graf at the Metropolitan Opera. I don't know mm -hmm. if you ever worked with her. Indeed. And I remember I just said to her, I stopped her one day when we were going through all the, just speaking through it. And I said, Excuse me, can I buy a vowel, please? Yes. <laughs> just there, there, I remember one high note is like a B flat or something in in the, in Rusalica, and it's V uh, V R S R D 
Yeah. S I or something. Vasorzi. Vasorzi. And you think, yeah, because you were. <laughs> it's going to cause some kind of an aneurysm. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, just to make all that, because I know in the very beginning of it, the first act, it's streets. Yeah. And I remember I have, I was listening to you, Vetograph, when we just did Rusalk. I was listening back and I was like, okay, she says it, I say it. She says it, I say it. And I go, well, that's not the same word. No, <laughs> you know? no. It's okay, so hard. Um, hard language. Can I tell so, you how much I loved your German when you did the videos for the Trumpera? Trump, Trump, Trump. <laughs> Trumpera. 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 That's right. Trumpera. Fabulous. That was hysterical. I, we needed like 20 more of those in our lives. Like that was really just kind of awesome. <laughs> well, the thing was, I did it for a show here in Canada called Because News. It's kind of just a more comedic take on... Uh, uh, wait, wait, don't tell me, which is a, right. I'm a big fan of. Oh, I love and, that. Uh, My husband yeah. and I listen to that show. It's fantastic. Every week. Yep. So, um, so I uh, did this. Uh, and uh, so Gavin Crawford, uh, we wanted to do this. And I said, oh, wait, I've got this. So um, um, I, 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 I just kind of translated the words and just added them in. And uh, oh. I, I took his words and put put them into German. And it it did well here on the social media did well but somehow it got picked up in germany and it it kind of went uh viral <laughs> i love it okay you need we need to get you on on that podcast like we need to get you on that uh wait wait don't tell me like you need to be the the special guest call in on that show somehow that needs to happen oh well that would be like that that is absolutely it's it's like telling me I sound like wunderlich you know, I was just like oh really I would love to do that I'd even want to be you know phone in for the one of those three segments that they right, do, right. Uh, you know stump the whatever yeah and um, uh, uh, so I would I would oh, just love to do it that needs to happen we need, to, the, we need to make some phone calls yeah I'm not the, I'm not that funny actually when it comes down to those kinds of things okay you're in this thing you got three panels two of them are sort of trained comedians right. journalists mm -hmm. and Hepner yeah uh, uh, no I think it would be brilliant. come on I, really I sometimes <laughs> think think the straight guy you know is the funniest because you know other people I think comedians sometimes try too hard yes. whereas the the, the, the drier straight guy just comes out with these one line singers like you did about the tenor and talk to my accountant. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Totally. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, motorcycles. I don't know the, motorcycles. Well, there's, there we go. I know that we're going to questions, right? And uh, I think one of my favorite uh, objects owned is, uh, is my motorcycle. Um, I've had, um, I've had two. And uh, well, actually, I've had three. Somebody gave me one, uh, wow. and I, I immediately gave it away because, um, well, there was a complicated reason reason for it. But I was this anyway. from Vancouver. Yes, I heard this story. <laughs> so, um, so I right now I have a I have a two thousand and nine. So it's not new. Uh, 2009 Goldwing Honda Goldwing, which is a touring motorcycle. Motorcycle. It's. It's basically the motorcycle equivalent of a stretch limo. Okay. So it's not, it's 1800 cc's. Uh, so, you know, most motorcycles are somewhere around 12, 13. Ooh. And some of them will stretch up into the, into the 2000, 2200, but those are like monsters. This okay. is not a monster. It has six cylinders. Um, and it is amazing. It's, it weighs... 1200 pounds wet i would guess like with gas and oil and everything and then you added the, the rider so it's that much more wow. or two because uh my beloved will ride with me oh okay do you have a sidecar yeah. no no just uh, okay. just just two up and um it's very smooth um and it, it'll go forever you can ride even on the 401 which of course is like the big big multi-lane highway with big trucks and stuff like that mm -hmm. it will it won't budge at all there you don't really? feel like you're buffeted by the wind i've got a windshield oh i've got i've got everything except a backup camera i mean uh, uh, um, cool. i've got heated seats uh, front and back i've got heated grips 
Um, it's Whoa. got it's a passive uh, heater on my on my legs and feet, mm -hmm. where you just have to open up some louvers and it will direct it to your feet and legs. Oh, cool! Um, and uh, I've got a backrest that's an addition, uh, so I can I have a good ergonomic way of of riding. Um, I sent it uh, on two I sent it on two occasions. Uh, I did longer rides. One I sent it down to Houston, and when I did Tristan there. And I, I rode it while I was there as my vehicle. Awesome. And then I rode it back home, which was the payoff. That was the big payoff. Whoa. And, um, and then the other one is I, I sent it off to Salt Lake City and I went down and picked it up and I was uh, uh, to greet my uh, first granddaughter. Um, she was about two weeks old. My wife was already there, but I was she was about two weeks old when I came. And then uh, Karen and I used the... The bike to get around and and did some exploring around some of the mountains to the south of Salt Lake, wow. and um, and then came back the whole way. Wow. Um, that wow. was fun. No, I, I was thinking about the Houston trip. It reminded me. So I'm I'm going along, and uh, I'm out of um, I'm out of Memphis. And I'm going, it's kind of one of those days that is it going to rain? Is it not mm -hmm. going to rain? You know, yeah. should I, should I just pull off and call it a day? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's sort of, you know, kind of like threatening. And I had my, I have Bluetooth head, headphones in my helmet. And then you just, prod, you do your music right. um, uh, from your phone. And uh, I was riding along and, you know, is it going to rain? And all of a sudden, it just just as I hit sort of this, I forget which which valley, which river valley it is, that you go down into, and just as I hit it, the sun came out, and the, the sort of the rays came through the clouds, and all of a sudden it was a beautiful summer day. And I go, wow! And on the on the music on my headphones, what is it? Is that Wolf? Um, it's that Wolf song. Um, of course, now my 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 covid slash alzheimer's <laughs> old man's brain has forgotten oh, the name of the it. song uh forgotten the name of the song it's very short um but it was just perfect because i was i was learning this repertoire so i wanted to hear okay. it yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. just it went down into the valley it was just uh just the most perfect moment yeah and then as i climbed back up out of the valley yeah it, it yeah. left but it was a nice kind of a moment to remember I love that. Okay, what else, what other kind of music do you listen to while you ride? Oh, yeah, jazz. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big jazz fan. Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah. Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, I like. I don't listen to a lot of jazz singers, but if they are, I'm going to listen to the old school melodic yeah. style more than I am um, people who do a lot of note bending that right. kind of makes me cringe. Um, uh, and I love big band. Oh, uh, and in, in particular, I love piano trio. Um, one of my favorites is a guy by the name of, well, of course, you know, Oscar and uh, Oscar Peterson and uh, Gene Harris. Uh, sorry, uh, Oscar Peterson. I'm trying to come up with the other. Uh, Gene Harris is another big favorite of mine. Uh, there's another, Ken Oliver Jones is who I was trying to think of. Um, and I just love, I love jazz trio and, and solo, solo jazz piano. So that's what I hear a lot. And also, it's, it's a time for me to listen to podcasts. Yes. Um, there's there was one uh, I forgot it was well, forgotten which podcast it was, but I think it's called Twenty Five and a Half Weeks. I don't know Ooh. if it's this. It might be This American Life. Okay. Or I've forgotten, but it's called Twenty, and it's this woman, this couple, this woman, and the baby. She had trouble the whole pregnancy, and Twenty Five and a Half Weeks can't stop it. The baby is born. Probably is not going to make it, and. It's only when the when the baby and the fetus is twenty six weeks old that they throw the resources towards it. So this is up up to the doctor somehow. Wow! And I, I heard the story. It's just riveting. I mean, this is on my way north from Houston too. <laughs> wow. And um, uh, I heard the story, and then once in a while, it might have been when it was Radio Lab, because once in a while, you would hear this little little human voice. Or a little voice or something in the background, and you, what is that? Was that was that a baby voice I heard? And then you keep on going, and then you hear it once, and it's only infrequently, and then all of a sudden you realize, apparently the doctor kind of threw the resources at the baby because they sensed something in that child. 
And uh, although technically they could have waited, you know, four days, didn't make it. And sure enough, that was, and the way it was layered in was just caught me. Just my heart was in my chest when I realized and that the little girl came on and talked. Whoa. Oh, it's just Love such it. a great moment. I so wonder where she is now. I don't know where she, I mean, she was at that point, that was, you know, 20, what is it, 14 or something. Um, uh, she was... Uh, she was just a little girl then, so you know she'd be she'd be in her young teens now. Cool, mm. but but so she was perfect, perfectly healthy. Okay, does your wife ever worry about like the, your safety on these bikes traveling those long distances? Um, yes, I mean, there, it wasn't um, it, it wasn't welcomed warmly when I came home with my my motorcycle. <laughs> It was a it was a cold summer at the Hefner household. Uh, I yeah, I, you know my husband forever like what do you want to a motorcycle? And I have said, listen, either over my dead body or if you do get one, because you know over your dead body. Oh my dead yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's uh, I mean like or, or whatever. I, I no, and um, that if you do bring one home then if you are in an accident and end up in a wheelchair, I'm sending you to your mother's. Do you really want that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> well, there was, uh, there was, you know, I did technically get permission. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Buy it. See if I care. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I tested it. Um, but in, in, uh, as a result, and this is, really pretty amazing for for karen is she has come to embrace it as being such a positive thing in my life love it that it it's a moment because what every guy needs is time sort of separate to just kind of process stuff yeah. you most uh, we most of us don't process it outwardly in you know verbally we tend to think through it and then sort of when we come out with something that's after the processing, yes. for example, uh, sorry, I have to get my, uh, my microphone back to my head. I had the opportunity to do uh, Titanic and uh, they offered it to me and it was this big tour. Uh, it would have started uh, in, well, we would have rehearsed in upstate New York, I think. We've gone to, I think, Los Angeles to open it, spent a number of months there couple of places and then a time in Toronto and then New York. And so it was the better part of a year. My radio career was already on the go and I loved it. I wanted to keep it. And they said, oh, no problem. We'll make accommodation for that. And I just, it was such a thing that I, you know, I, I was, they gave me every reason. And of course, it, I, they would have paid me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what to do. And Karen says, go for a ride. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hopped up, uh, hopped on the bike and I went for a ride and up into the Halliburton region, which uh, mm. Sandra, you'd probably know up to up towards Richard where, Marchison which, lives exactly, up there. Yeah, exactly. The, he has the cottage up there. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. I, I didn't, in a sense, I didn't come to a decision riding and it, cause I was just sort of thinking about it and mulling it over in my head. And somehow, in the course of all of that, I gave myself permission to say no. Mm. Because yeah. here was this opportunity which would, well, which was going to be very, very difficult. And it was going to work me to within an inch of my bone and be able to do the radio and this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I finally realized it'll kill me. Mm. And, I, and I, so I sort of, in that ride, it was the decision to so that I could say no. So I said no. And then it came back, David Mervish uh, here in Toronto said, mm -hmm. would you do four weeks here in Toronto? And I went, yeah. So I didn't, okay. I went to England and I rehearsed for two weeks. Okay. And then we brought it here and, and did the finals. Mm -hmm. We performed for four weeks. It was just absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. I, I brought the whole gang up to um, up to our house. It was the it was mid June. It was not a nice day, kind of spitting all day. Mm -hmm. And I brought them up, and I, and I had just opened my pool. It was barely warm enough, and that week it had gone crazy green. If you know a pool, you know the problem. Mm -hmm. And so I'd somehow got it together, and I got the whole thing up. I I asked uh, I asked the Mervishes 
um, could they recommend a bus company? Because they knew they would probably have these kind of connections. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, sure. And they made the reservation. And I don't believe it, but they were so kind and they paid for the bus. So this big, huge oh, school wow. bus pulls in front of my suburban home out in Scarborough. And... Um, and these, you know, 40 people piled out in a house and awesome. um, and they went uh, and I sort of apologize. I'm sorry, the weather's not very good. It says, we're British. We don't care. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it always rains. <laughs> yes. Now, we wanted to ask where you kept your your Grammys, but um, I see yeah. over awesome. your yeah, shoulder. There's one there. And if you can see, there's another one there yep. and over on the other shelf shelf on the other side. And there's also, you can see beside the Grammy on the top mm -hmm. shelf is an Echo Prize from, it's a German. And yes. uh, I think there's a National Arts Center mm -hmm. and somewhere there's there's Junos hanging around here too, which so. Carrie, you may not know that is a, the Canadian uh, pretend Grammy. And uh, so Stop I have it. three of those. I have three Grammys and three, um, and, uh, three Grammys and, and three Junos. I love that. Awesome. It's awesome. Oh, I, got, you know, I got so the, the Echo Prize brings up an experience. I, I'm a storyteller. If you haven't figured this out, and oh, I um, love it. I love it. <laughs> so I, I was going to the, uh, the the Echo Awards in Cologne in Germany back in the mid '90s, and I was uh, uh, somehow I don't know whether I was a you know new artist or something, but I knew I was going to be getting an award, mm -hmm. and so BMG who I was with picked me up in a limo and they said, sorry, we have to make a stop. We're going to pick up Krista Ludwig. And, uh, okay. So they okay. stopped the, 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 produ the, the main guy went in into the building and brought her out. And obviously he told her who I was. And so she, she comes into the car. She slips in the back seat with me and she says, uh, I know Ludwig, you know, Hepner, Hepner, you know, the, how you, how Germans do it. And she says, so, haben Sie auch Kühe? What? I scratched my head. I know I'm not that great at German, but I could swear she just asked me if I had cows. <laughs> and, I, and I said, Entschuldigen Sie bitte? And she said, haben Sie auch Kühe? And I went into English. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand. And she said, and she burst into laughter. She said, I'm a very good friend of John Vickers. And I know he's very successful with his farm and all his cows. I assumed every Canadian held in Tanner had cows. <laughs> Do you know where his house is? Um, I, it, it was up in Orangeville and I was offered uh, in, in one of my boys went to a, to a school, a grammar school that, that did rugby. And so we were down at Upper Canada College playing them. And um, one of their parents came over and said, you're Ben Hepner? Yes, I'm so-and-so. And I have a, uh, I have the John Vickers farm in, in my portfolio of properties. I'm a real estate agent. Would you be interested? I went, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I love John Vickers, but I do not want to own a farm. <laughs> I, so I, I drive don't... by it. It's literally around the corner from our house. Oh, Carrie's wow. driven by it. I don't think she knew it, but yeah, it's our piano tuner was John Vickers' piano tuner too. Oh, fantastic! It's crazy. I went by Nellie Melba's place in in Mel uh, in uh, outside of Melbourne. Cool. cool. That was kind of fun. That's cool. Awesome. Are you going to write a book? I think we need a book. No, yes. no. Uh, people, uh, no. My, my book really is the stories that I told on radio. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm much more sh uh, suited to the short form. Okay. To what radio people call turns in between mm -hmm. the music. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, I mean, I have a story I think I told about. It's Louis Quillico, who I adored, oh. Louis. Oh, he's so... Oh. Uh, there's, well, there's a couple to tell. The one, I, I'll just make it very short. He was doing... Um, <laughs> Uh, he was doing Traviata and uh, he walked down this big flight of stairs somehow in the center and uh, I don't know, it was, if, if, you know, Disprezzo Degno or something. Anyway, at one point he sucked his tummy into, I think, I think he did it on purpose. But all of a sudden his pants went <laughs> straight to the <laughs> ground. <laughs> I love it. Oh no! He had, he had these fabulously colored 
um, fabulously colored uh, boxers, uh, which I, what's why I think it was on purpose. But mm -hmm. anyway, so the other story, which I thought was 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 maybe worth telling. So this was at the memorial service for Lois Marshall. Uh, you, I don't know if you know, she was a Canadian. She was opera singer, but she didn't do a lot of opera. She had polio early on and didn't do a lot. She was like, uh, I forgot who was, uh, maybe did she work for Toscanini? Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm telling the truth there or mixing. Somebody up. famous. Anyway, Big somebody, she worked with great, and she was an amazing singer. Um, I had sung duets with her uh, on tour with a choir, uh, Vancouver Chamber Choir. And uh, anyway, John Vickers and I are, are speaking on behalf of Lois Marshall. And so everything finishes. I, I was four and a half minutes. John was 21. Anyway. Uh, Just saying. We were, we were told we had five. <laughs> Okay. So, and who's going to tell John Vickers to shut up? Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, so we're back. We're walking off stage, and we go into the ante room, you know, or also off the plat you know, church platform, and we go around to the corner. And John is leading, and in the ante room, there's Louis Quillico standing with, um, uh, uh, with with two canes standing there. And uh, John said, "Hey, Louis." How are you doing? He says, well, I'm pretty good, you know, uh, John. How about you? He says, oh, good. He says, uh, what's with the canes, uh, Louis? Well, you know how it is. And um, and how about you? Uh, I forget what he says. How, how are your knees? I think, well, that's what it was. How are your knees? Because he always had trouble. And, um, and, uh, and he lifted up one leg and he did a flex. He flexed it as he says, look at that. And... Louis says, you know, I like you better bow-legged. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Oh, now, Louis thought it was anecdotes. funny. I thought it was funny. Victor's John, not so, sure. not no. so sure. He did ask me at one point, because my, my career was sort of coming up, and it was, everybody was interviewing me. And it was everywhere, you know, Air right. Canada magazines and stuff like that. And he said, uh, Ben, are you singing too much? And I, and I went, you know, John, it's really just smoke and mirrors. Uh, you know, it's just that people are, I don't even have a publicity agent. I'm just, they're just interviewing me. I can't help it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, John and I got along very well, actually. Oh. Well, he, you he know, was very respectful. He, he seemed like it. I, unfortunately, I never got to meet him. But everybody around our area where we live that knew him said oh. that he was, what you see is what you get. Yeah, yeah. No, and I respect uh, that. Yeah, uh, I met him in Ottawa. Um, uh, people told me that when he shakes your hand, men, when he shakes a man's hand for the first time, he'll basically ch check your manhood by really shaking it. Yeah, oh, and uh, fortunately, I'd heard that in advance <laughs> from a surgeon who had suffered the consequences. Whoa. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I made sure that I I was prepared, and. Uh, I think that's why he was always he was always good to me. <laughs> and you passed the test. I passed, passed the test. test. What do you do? You have a few more minutes at the end. We always do these quick these things called rapid fire questions. All right, I'll make up some stuff. So, yeah. oh, I love that. Make it up. I'm pretty sure you're pretty good at them. So, <clears throat> well, this is the Proust questionnaire, isn't it? Well, yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll let Carrie start this time. All right. Oh, okay. Um, 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 what single person most changed your life? Oh, uh, I think it was a professor of music. He was a conductor and my, he was my theory teacher in the first year and a conductor of a chamber choir, Cortland Hultberg. And it was, it was the reason, I think he reason he changed my relationship with music and how I could relate. Uh, maybe even how a man could relate to music because I was very feeling very sensitive to this kind of stuff mm -hmm. but I probably felt you know coming from a farm farm background you didn't show those emotions um, and I remember him being uh, on we're on tour we're in uh, we're in a house and he's listening to uh, the Mozart bassoon concerto and uh, I noticed he's crying he's in tears and I said, uh, Court, I said, uh, or I probably said, you know, Mr. Holtberg, um, 
your uh, is this piece is this piece special to you?" And he said, "Yeah, this is the last piece I played before I hung up my bassoon." Whoa. And so, in, and there were there were opportunities like that all through. I could tell you lots of stories, but he was one I think who made a big big influence on me. Cool. What opera best describes you? Oh, Meister Singer. Which yeah, well. is, you have a Grammy yeah. for that. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it, it's because he was an outsider um, mm -hmm. and um, he had ability, but no, he had no connections, no uh, uh, and a sort of family connections, no breeding. Mm -hmm. And I related to that character like you would not believe. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, yeah, so he, he didn't know all the rules and, and I I felt like that that was that was me just on stage. Mm -hmm. I I didn't know how to put one foot in front of another, uh, but I, I felt like I, I I could sing a little bit, so I, I just kept on doing it. A little bit. Singer. I think a bit a bit more than a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I got there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you, there's some there's something interesting that that I that I, I figured out throughout. Or it was early on in my career as as my you know I, I started fairly at the big houses quite quickly, and I was working with these incredible people. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I just hope I I acquit myself in a in an easy way. I don't embarrass myself because I don't have the experience. <laughs> And then I woke up one morning and I thought, what a stupid attitude that is. You want to set the, you, you want to set the standard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may not, you may not actually set it, but you want to try. Yeah. And so that was the, it was a great change in my life. And it just was like that. I bet. Yep. Yeah. That day. That I did the same thing with stage fright. I said yep. to myself, self, this is stupid. The only person you're hurting is yourself. Yeah. And like that, it went away. Yeah. I, I always say that the stage fright never existed unless I hadn't, uh, un unless I hadn't prepared enough. Right. Then I sort of felt that that was mostly recitals. <laughs> <laughs> but now you can use music stands, so who cares? <laughs> exactly. Did you have, Here, the, did you have those dreams? Uh, whenever I'm not prepared enough, I always dream these dreams where I walk out on stage and I'm like, what? You mean, what, what are we doing? I didn't, what In check? I in, in check, check. Yeah. <laughs> everything's in check. Yep. Oh, Jesus, help me now. Mm, okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, Carrie, your turn. Okay. What is the strangest thing a fan ever asked you? Mm. Um. Well, there was one. It was a strange. Um, it was a strange incident. I was I was signing CDs at the Met Opera Shop uh, in New York. And this woman came up to me and she started talking to me. I signed her CD and she was telling me, oh, I spend a lot of time in, in Canada these days. And um, uh, and they, they speak of you so highly. And they were telling me of, of you know, they were nice things about, about, about me, essentially, that, that she had found out mm -hmm. while she was in Canada. And I said, oh, I said, what takes you to Canada? And she stopped and her eyes went kind of, you know, wide. She turned and left. So I looked at my weird. I looked at my manager and I said, "Well, that was strange." Well, for the next performance, there was a letter waiting for me backstage from this woman, and she said, "I'm sorry that happened, but still, it's, this is still kind of fresh on my mind." She said, "Remember Swiss Air one one one? You remember?" Her daughter was on that flight. Oh my God. And she said they'd had an argument. She didn't want her daughter to go that to go early to Switzerland. She was going to Switzerland to study. And uh, she left earlier than mom wanted. She was on the flight. So she said, but it was it was the most incredible. Um, the most incredible moment that that uh, I, I can think of. It, that one that one came to my mind. Mm -hmm. and if you ever have Christine Brewer on, you need to ask yes. her this question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that she, she would has be a, a much she has a must she has a must better answer than um, I do. She, she would be a great interview. Yeah. I know, right, Sandra? That ask needs to happen today. Okay. I will. I will do that right <laughs> afterward. Next question. All right. Song that always gets stuck in your head that you just can't get out. <laughs> okay, I saw you ask to that to other people. 
And I thought, oh, this is going to be embarrassing because the one that gets stuck in my head, there is a children's entertainer by the name of, uh, oh, wouldn't you know, my, my head, um, uh, my head has just frozen his name out of, uh, out, out of my head. Oh, what? Anyway, he has a song. It'll, I think it'll come to me. Um, called Smokey the Bear. Here comes Smokey the Bear. And for some reason, after I heard it for the first time, of course, my kids listen to it endlessly on loop, you know. And so it's here comes Smokey the Bear. No, Stompy. Here comes Stompy the Bear. Here comes Stompy the Bear. And from that moment on, every time as a man who is 65 years old, I have to get up in the middle of the night sometimes. And my, my feet hit the floor and I stand up and there's usually a little sort of a nightlight that casts a bit of a shadow. And as I'm walking, I go, here comes Stompy the Bear. Here comes Stompy the Bear. <laughs> Cas oh, the, name, the name of the artist is Caspar Baby Pants. Caspar Baby Pants. Caspar, I think it's A-R maybe, or maybe it's E-R. I don't know. Caspar oh, Baby Pants. God. I'm so sorry we asked that. <laughs> if you are a, a parent of small children, go and find him. He's fantastic. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. What's the most beloved thing that you own? Well, we've already talked about it. Motorcycle, I guess, is is what I would say. You 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 know, I I can't say that I ever own a family. I own my relationships with them, but uh, I'll go with motorcycle because it has such a positive influence on me, and um, and I'm careful. I'm careful. Not not that okay. I couldn't have a I couldn't have a problem, but uh, knock on wood, knock on wood. I couldn't. I couldn't ride. I have only just started riding last week for the first time this year because Karen was suffering. She could not walk. And for for 14 weeks, she was basic. She was sleeping on the couch. She couldn't Whoa. even get upstairs. Wow. Um, so uh, she was reliant on me uh, for everything. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I go out, even if I something small happens to me and I, you know, I break a wrist or something. Right. Um, uh, I can't have that happen. So I didn't wow. ride until last Responsible. Time. Yeah. Well, yeah. You have to do what you have to do. It's sure do. think of all the stuff that she sacrificed for me when I was on the road those years. Oh, By the way, I wanted to tell you that she's um, she's one of those. She I've, I've met a lot of opera spouses, significant others who went to every rehearsal, every performance, and my beloved said to me, "Sweetheart, I love you, but I'm only going to one show." <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, that's her husband. <laughs> Shall we do the last question? All right. Um, oh, yeah, last question. Okay. If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say as you walk through the pearly gates? You're late. What time? <laughs> no, you don't want to hear him say that. <laughs> you're early. Yeah, you're early. <laughs> I don't know. Just what came to my mind. I love it. That's great. <laughs> What well, a thank joy. You and honestly, it has been a joy talking with you. And we're going to, I guess, congratulations are in order for retirement. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it. it will be coming out. It will be coming out towards the end. And uh, it, it will probably, this will be heard by a couple of the opera people who will get it out into the public. And I think, you know, I've really been stop, stopped work since the end of uh, June. Um, but it's now the uh, Labor Day weekend is the last. We do yeah. we're doing repeats the whole time. Well, okay. enjoy enjoy every minute of it. Oh my God! Oh, thank you so much. And our house you. is anytime you want to come drive up, take your motorcycle up to Caledon. All right, and I'm, we're I'm, home, I'm, which is never. I may, <laughs> I may, I may uh, ship you an email to get your address. Perfect. Sounds great. Absolutely. All enjoy right. enjoy the rest of your summer, and thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. Thank you. Thank it's been you. fun. Thanks. Huge hugs. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.